So we are now ready to get started with our second panel event. Um, and also a big pleasure um, to be able to bring together a panel on welcoming communities. Um, and so we would like to take a moment to welcome our moderator. So Alphonse Nadem Ahola is joining us as our moderator for the session. And Desiree is going to introduce him. Monsieur Alphonse Ndem Aola est le directeur général de la de francophonie albertaine plurielle, une agence d'établissement francophone à Edmonton. C'est pas moi qui m'ai redit. Depuis son arrivée au Canada, Alphonse s'est résolument engagé dans le bénévolat en vue d'améliorer les conditions de vie, de vie et l'inclusion des immigrants francophones de Albert, en Alberta. Il a été vice-président externe de l'Association des étudiants diplômés de l'Université de l'Alberta, président du conseil d'administration de la FRAP, président du réseau d'immigration francophone de l'Alberta, membre du comité consultatif national pour l'établissement des francophones et membre du conseil exécutif du conseil canadien pour les réfugiés. Il me fait un grand plaisir d'accueillir Alphonse Aola, qui va aussi euh, vous présenter les autres panélistes de cette session. Bienvenue. Merci. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, for this uh, presentation. I just want to add that I was also recently, even though I have to say it also, I was recently appointed as uh, on the premier. Alberta Premier Council on Multiculturalism, just so, just, just so that you know. And uh, I also, <laughs> you never know, if you don't say that, you never know what people will think, so you have to say that. So I, uh, now that it's said, I just wanted to, it's an honor to be here, and it's, uh, I'm so happy, and this place is so beautiful. You know, I was coming with my wife. We were landing. And we haven't, we have not landed. And she said, Alphonse, why don't you, don't we move here? <laughs> and I said, you haven't even landed and you want, you already want to move here. So please pray for me because my wife may not want to go back with me. <laughs> so please <laughs> pray for me. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, I will be speaking mostly in French, so be prepared for the interpretation. But I, before that, I just wanted to say that it's very, small communities are very important, even though they are not always small. But they are even more important for French-speaking people. <laughs> and uh, I think there is a fair representation of French in this session and it's a very good, but I hope that next time we will have even more French people here, more uh, workshop in French, because I think it's very important. So thank you very much, and I have a, a very interesting panel here. I'm going to introduce each of them, and after I will go on uh, introducing them as they are speaking here. So the first one that I'm going to introduce this morning is Victoria SS, Principal Investigator and Co-Chair of the Pathways to Prosperity Partnership. Victoria SS est chercheuse principale et co-présidente du partenariat Voix vers la, prospéri la Prospérité. Elle est également professeure de psychologie et directrice du Network for Economic and social trends at the University of Western. En tant que bénévole, Victoria est chargée de liaison en matière de recherche pour le London and Mid Lessex Local Immigration Partnership et préside son groupe de travail sur les communautés accueillantes ainsi que son groupe de travail sur la mesure des résultats. Ses recherches portent sur la politique et la pratique de l'immigration notamment les attitudes du public à l'égard de l'immigration et de la diversité culturelle. 
les pratiques prometteuses en matière d'établissement et d'intégration, les facteurs favorisant l'établissement et l'intégration des immigrants, et enfin la mesure de la capacité d'accueil des communautés, des besoins des immigrants et des résultats des immigrants. Elle est membre de l'Institut canadien de recherche avancée. Et sur ce, je vais passer la parole à Victoria pour ces sept minutes. Victoria, vous avez la parole. Good morning. I'm not as tall as Alphonse. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work um, I've been doing on welcoming communities with Leah Hamilton at Mount Royal University and Awish Aslam, Priscilla Barras, and Alina Sutter at Western University, including some work we've been doing recently on discrimination and on attitudes towards immigrants and immigration in smaller centers. So let me start off by talking about what a welcoming community is. And when I talk about welcoming communities in this context, I'm talking specifically about welcoming communities for immigrants. So we have defined welcoming communities as a collective effort. It involves all of us to design and sustain a place where immigrants feel that they belong and that supports their economic, social, cultural, and civic political integration. And a welcoming community has structures, processes, and practices in place to meet the needs and promote the inclusion of immigrants in all aspects of life. And a welcoming community actively works to ensure that these are effective. So it's not enough to just say you're a welcoming community, you have to have these structures, processes, practices in place, and you have to actually actively work to make sure that they're effective. So why is work on welcoming communities important today? Well, welcoming communities are needed for the successful integration of immigrants. And this is essential because, of course, we know that the Levels Plan for 2023 to 2025 means that over 465,000 new immigrants are expected to arrive in Canada each year. And Canada is depending on immigration to facilitate post-COVID recovery. We also know that maintaining the vitality of smaller Canadian communities and of Francophone minority communities often depends on the attraction and retention of immigrants, including Francophone immigrants. Work on welcoming communities is also important because there is a continuing emphasis on outcome measurement, including at the community level. And this is to ensure that the work we're doing to promote welcoming communities is working and that we're having an impact. And outcome measurement is also important um, because it's an important component of IRCC's core principles that underpin all programming, as you know, that is funded under the settlement program. It's the O in core and it's the C in core. And perhaps most importantly, creating welcoming communities is a social justice issue because we attract immigrants, we want immigrants to come to Canada, and this must be paired with providing them with the welcome and the supports they need in order to thrive. There's no use bringing people to Canada and not supporting them and making sure that they are successful here. So as many of you know, and some of you gained experience on this at our toolkit workshop yesterday, we've been working on two welcoming communities toolkits. And Toolkit 1 is complete, and it's available on the P2P website um, if you look for the uh, Welcoming Communities Toolkits. And the first toolkit focuses on what communities have to do to measure um, how welcoming they are. And the second toolkit, which will be released later this year, focuses on promoting welcoming communities. So what structures, what processes, what practices need to be in place to promote the characteristics of a welcoming community. And it will share many promising practices that uh, we can learn from. So in order to um, measure and actually promote welcoming communities, we need to know what they are, what they consist of, and we need to know what characteristics make a community welcoming. And for our toolkits, we've done a lot of research on this. 
We've conducted uh, literature reviews. We conducted polls of many, many um, members of the settlement sector, of government and others. Um, anybody working in immigration, uh, many people working in immigration have been um, polled um, as to what characteristics are important. And as a result, we've come up with a list of 19 characteristics of a welcoming community and some rough order of their importance. Um, now, I would say that importance obviously differs between communities, and of course, importance differs over time. For example, you can see the first uh, characteristic in cluster A, which is uh, access to affordable, adequate, and suitable housing. Um, in our previous uh, version of this back in 2010 was not seen as so important. Now, everybody's talking about housing. So this is cluster A, and these were the characteristics that many people thought were the most important characteristics um, for supporting immigrants um, in our communities. And this is cluster B. Things like access to transportation, educational opportunities, uh, municipal services that are responsive to immigrants, etc. And then this is cluster C. So these characteristics are still important, um, but they were considered a little less important than those in clusters A and B. So those are the characteristics of a welcoming community, but importantly, what I want to talk about now has to do with how important reducing discrimination is in promoting welcoming communities in smaller centers. First of all, discrimination plays a role in many of the 19 characteristics of a welcoming community. So discrimination, for example, in housing, in employment, in healthcare, in access to services, and for each of these characteristics of a welcoming community, we have indicators, and the presence of discrimination um, is one of the important indicators for many, many of these characteristics. Uh, we know that discrimination is associated with lower feelings of welcome and belonging in a community, and it can lead to lower retention rates in smaller communities. And really importantly, we know that discrimination levels tend to be quite high in smaller centers. So for example, these are the results of a representative survey that we conducted in nine regions of southwestern Ontario, with five of these regions containing only smaller communities and uh, four containing small and medium-sized communities. And this work was conducted with the local immigration partnerships in each of these regions to understand what was going on in our communities. And what you can see here is that in all but one of the regions, over half of immigrants and racialized individuals report experiencing discrimination in the region in the past three years. Okay, more than half in the past three years. And these levels are quite a bit higher than those found in Canadian national surveys, which often represent the larger communities, large urban centers. And when you think about it, it may be attributable to the fact that uh, residents of smaller communities have less experience with diversity, they may feel less comfortable around people from different cultures, and they may be more concerned about demographic changes in their communities. And uh, this discrimination was most likely to be taking place, you can probably guess, in employment settings and also in public places, on public transportation, uh, in parks, in rec centers, in restaurants. People reported discrimination very frequently in those types of settings. Employment in terms of uh, obtaining a job, at their job from coworkers, from bosses, from uh, um, clients, of a company. So discrimination is happening frequently in smaller communities. And this means that in working towards welcoming communities that attract and retain, and that retention piece is really important, it will be essential to promote more positive attitudes among established members of these communities, of smaller communities. 
And I would suggest that one way to do this <clears throat> is to highlight the positive characteristics or the positive aspects of immigration to smaller communities as seen by members of these communities. So when you uh, survey, and what we did was uh, conducted a representative survey of public attitudes um, towards immigrants and immigration in 11 smaller communities across Canada, um, in every province. Um, these are the reported positive impacts of immigration in these communities, and why not take advantage of that? Why not take advantage of the positive things that people are saying about immigration? to their local community, as reported by the people who are living in these communities. So for example, they talk about um, promotion of multiculturalism and diversity of perspectives. And here's a quote. Um, as a relatively insulated community, introducing multiculturalism to the community provides more information and understanding of the whole world. Filling of labor shortages. So how, do, how is this expressed by people in these communities? And they say things like, there's a huge labor shortage in all areas of employment, especially in healthcare, and I wish there was a way to fast track doctors and nurses to qualify them to work in Canada. So positive impact on the economy, slightly different than the uh, labor shortages. Uh, here's a quote, uh, more wage earners and homeowners, bigger tax base. We'll have more supports in our community. Positive characteristics of immigrants. I see many smart and hardworking people who want to get back to the community. They're going to higher education and be doctors and social workers to generally give back to Canada. Let's take advantage of this. Uh, positive contributions to the community. They volunteer their time to look for the event that can benefit the community. They create a group to organize the event that benefits people around, and they donate resources. Um, diversity in arts and culture. The cultural diversity of our community has increased, restaurant and social variety of our region has increased, and the arts have been revitalized. And finally, population growth. The city has felt like it was dying for a very, very long time for me. More people coming means it will be around longer. So what I'm suggesting is we know what people think about the positive characteristics of immigration. And actually, when you look at some of the Immigration Matter videos, they often take advantage of some of these things. And so why don't we take advantage of these positive things that people are saying, even in these smaller communities? Now, the other side of this picture, of course, is what supports immigrants who experience discrimination in these communities um, would find useful, and uh, I don't have the results yet, but we are now working in smaller communities, um, interviewing immigrants about what supports they would like. When they experience discrimination more generally in their communities, uh, we've uh, asked them about reporting discrimination, um, and we will have those results probably by the end of the year. And I'll end on that note. Um, and this is my contact information if you have any questions, comments, et cetera. Thank you very much. Merci, merci beaucoup, Victoria. Uh, C'est évident que la, la, les communautés accueillantes sont caractérisées par des groupes de caractéristiques. J'ai aimé cette façon de présenter ça, pas des groupes de caractéristiques. C'est pas seulement les caractéristiques, mais elle a classé aussi ces caractéristiques là par groupe. Et elle a souligné quelque chose d'extrêmement important, quel que soit le niveau où vous trouvez dans l'échelle de l'accueil de ces nouveaux arrivants, c'est très important que vous compreniez le, le rôle de la discrimination. C'est un problème à tous les niveaux, quel que soit le côté où vous le trouvez, c'est très important. Donc merci beaucoup Victoria pour cette excellente présentation. Et la suite que je me doute va être tout aussi excellente que la première, c'est de Cornel Pache. J'espère que je prononce bien le nom. Cornel est de l'Indigenous Community Coordinator de Portage Urban Indigenous People Coalition. Cornel est titulaire d'un baccalauréat en sciences politiques avec une mineure en études autochtones et actuellement le coordonnateur de la communauté autochtone 
de la Portage Urban Indigenous People Coalition. Auparavant, Cornell a été un leader de sa communauté pendant dix ans. En tant que chef et directeur de l'éducation pour la Première Nation Dakota Tipi, directeur du Eagle Fire Youth Center, et il, est également passé, il a également passé sept ans dans le secteur bancaire. Cornell est actuellement membre des comités tourisme, PCCR, PCRC Logement et Discovery Patch de Portage. L'éducation de Cornell, son expérience professionnelle, sa vaste connaissance de la communauté et sa perspective autochtone sont autant d'atouts précieux pour la communauté. Euh, Mystic est le coordonnateur qui, avec lui, il va venir après. C'est le coordonnateur du programme de partenariat local pour l'immigration. Ils sont tous les deux de la même région, mais nous allons commencer d'abord par Cornel, je pense. Alors, Cornel, si tu es prêt, je vais te passer la parole pour ton temps de parole. Merci. Good morning. Piyama. My name is uh, Cornell Pache, and uh, my traditional Indian name is Hanska Imani, meaning uh, walks tall. And uh, we shortened that version of, uh, of that meaning of walks tall because uh, in our tradition, our Dakota tradition, we usually have a ceremony whenever there's a, a traditional name that a person uh, needs to get one as a part of their tradition. And as a part of their naming ceremony, there's a, a, name, a naming process. So in that ceremony that takes place, you have to provide the medicine man with a pouch of tobacco in exchange for the vision that he receives in order to be, in order to receive the name that you receive. In my instance, I, uh, I didn't have to go through that process because uh, the medicine man had, uh, had approached me, he, he had seen me uh, in my work that I do, and uh, a vision came to him. The vision that came to him was he saw a pack of wolves, he saw uh, a wolf running ahead, and in that vision, it came to him the name. So he approached me afterwards and said to me that I was, I walked, he, he the, 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 the vision that he had, it, it was walked among many colors, was, was what the, the, the name was and, and the vision that he received. And how fortunate enough uh, my life has taken me to, my life experience has taken me to, to walking amongst many colors. And what a vision, uh, you know, for that medicine man to, to have to say, that I walk amongst many colors, and it's from what I he he see here today and the many events that I've been to, uh, the name suits me, and, uh, I, and that's how I carry myself. I walk amongst many colors. And in my role and what I do in Portage La Prairie, it's... Um, it's been, it's been a lot of fun the last five years because in my experience, I've, I've come across discrimination, I've come across racism, I've come across many, many uh, uh, barriers in order to, to get to where we need to go today. Portage of Prairie is a population of 13,000, and of that 13,000, 23% after 2016 census, uh, it was identified that 23% were uh, indigenous. And what we found was uh, after the 2021 census, it, it increased to 32% that identified as indigenous or Métis. So the city recognized at that time in 2018 that there was a need there was a need to, to develop an urban indigenous strategy so that the city could prepare themselves to meet the needs of that increase in population. And it was, uh, it was an exercise for them that needed to be done almost 10 years earlier. And uh, it's been slow in Portage La Prairie. In the last uh, five years and the work that I've been able to do as a result of my previous experience as leader, 
to bring those stories forward and to try to convince your elite, try to convince your city council, try to convince your businesses that we are here, we were always here, and 73% of the, the, the First Nation population in and around Portage of Prairie, there's seven First Nations that surround Portage of Prairie, and there was a need for us to make that change and adapt to that change. And 73% were residing or moving off reserve and migrating to, to cities like Portage of Prairie, Brandon, Thompson, Winnipeg, the Paw. And there is five coalitions in Manitoba in those, in those cities that are currently have coordinators and liaison that do the similar kind of responsibilities that I do. And, uh, and we see that there is, there is a need, and specifically in Portage La Prairie. Portage La Prairie is so rich in that indigenous culture, that heritage, that language, Many of the, 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 the things that we lost during residential schools we're now getting back to in our, in our school divisions, on, uh, divisions, our curriculums. And uh, Portage de Prairie, if you take a look at Portage de Prairie, total enrollment last year was almost 4,700. And of that 4,700, almost half uh, 2,700 were identified as indigenous uh, and, and the population was increasing. And throughout that time, throughout the five years, uh, you know, I've also noticed that there was a lot of uh, public education that, that, that I do, but I also uh, have a lot of, had a lot of questions on, on my heritage and where I come from because I'm still, I still reside on Dakota TV. We have a population of 400 and, I, and we're situated two and a half miles from Portage La Prairie. So uh, it's, it's interesting when you talk about that, uh, that history. So when Portage wanted that indigenous history, that experience of what our, our, our indigenous history was, we found that there was a lot of Ojibwe, we found that there was a lot of Cree, we found there was a lot of Métis, and more so we found that there was a lot of Dakota history associated with Portage La Prairie. So a lot of our Dakota history is being included in many of the projects that we have in Portage Prairie. What they were more interested in was our history in Parish Lot 99. And Parish Lot 99, the residents that made up Dakota, the old Sioux village, that history is now becoming a part of Portage Prairie. And there's a lot of individuals interested in how we came to be in, in Portage of Prairie, and it was in, during the Minnesota uprising that uh, the chiefs and the leadership, the, after the, the Custer's last stand, the, we moved to, to where we are today in, in Canada before Canada was Canada. So that's where we resided, and uh, I know that if you were to Google Sioux Village, the, Google the Dakota history, You'll find that many of the, the famous Sioux leadership, like Sitting Bull, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, but more so uh, Sitting Bull. Uh, he spent time in, in the territory, in his territory that he thought was his territory, but it was also Canada, but they referred to him as a refugee. And today, you see the many treaty bands. There's 11 different treaties in Canada, plus the peace treaties, but you also, there's the Dakota. The Dakota, we are not signature to treaty. And when you ask the Americans about the Canadian Sioux, they always say, they always refer to us as, as uh, the Canadian Sioux. When you ask the Canadian government, you ask them how they, they, they see the, the Sioux in Canada, they refer to us as refugees and American Sioux. And that in itself has been a struggle, as mentioned in 10 years in leadership. It was, I was always trying to, to resolve that matter, always trying to work with Canada to, to change that. So as I, as I present here, and as I, as, as I talk to you, 
a couple of weeks ago, the, the, all Dakota bands came together. There's, there's five Dakota bands in Manitoba and four Dakota bands in Saskatchewan. And two weeks ago, they were able to sit down and get together and meet with the minister, Mark Miller. And Mark Miller, in very shortly, he had indicated to us, because many of the elders, many of the leadership in those communities uh, requested or asked the, the minister what, how he saw the Dakota, because we, we, we do not want to continue to be considered refugees, because I'm here, I've always lived here, the Dakotas, their territories were here even before Canada was Canada. So I just thought I'd public educate you on, 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 on that history. But there's a lot of history to tell. And very shortly, the minister has indicated that he's finally going to recognize the Dakota under Section 35 of the Indian Act, which will be a good day for us. And that is coming up in the near future. And what I do here with, uh, with Mitch in welcoming communities, Mitch and I and, and uh, uh, the LIP, uh, we, we are under one roof, uh, Megan, Mitch, Dawn, we all sit under one roof and uh, we work towards making Portage a welcoming community and some of our initiatives that we engage anti-racism education, all, all that, that, that makes that uh, a working community, to function as a working community, we work together and so much of it, I bring to the table my experience in working with the Dakota Ojibwe Tribal Council, the chiefs, the surrounding communities, the urban indigenous, the urban youth, the urban seniors, and we found that when we worked towards trying to, to provide resources for those groups, we also found that the newcomers and the immigrants were experiencing the same barriers that we were experiencing. So we decided that in our best interest that it would be nice to pool our resources together and to co-develop a plan in working with those groups so that there was a better appreciation and a better understanding of Port is the Prairie. And uh, it's for us, we've had fun and many of the projects that we've done together, our anti-racism walks, our discussions, our, our September 30th day event, we you know it's, it includes everyone. We've had commemorations at City Hall to involve those groups and it's it's just uh, you know it's just adapting to that change and it's preparing the you know Portage La Prairie for that change the municipality for that change so very slowly but surely we are decolonizing Portage La Prairie And with that, I would say, Piyama, have a nice day, have a nice week, and safe travels. Wopida, Piyama, Edo. Thank you. Voilà, je vous avais prévenu que ce sera très passionnant. Vous voyez très bien combien de fois c'est passionnant. Donc, je voudrais vraiment remercier le, le je voudrais remercier l'ancien qui vient de nous de nous parler Cornel et je vais passer la parole à maintenant je vois dans mes notes que je dois passer la parole à Michtil qui est, ils sont tous venus comme je vous l'ai annoncé tantôt de de la même région Mitch est le Mitch is the local immigration partnership program coordinator in Portage la Prairie he has spent the last decade in social services and has made it, it his mission to improve the community of Portage, La Prairie, by trying to understand how system works, how people interact with them, and how improvement to them will not be made until we look outside to our own culture for help. Mitch has spent 30 or 36 years in chronic pain due to 
an untone common condition and tries to apply the lesson learned from his own journey to better understand how people relate to one another and how small changes in one's mindset can have drastic impact on the work we do. So, Pete, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry for the people in the front row. I mean, podiums don't really see eye to eye. <laughs> That's okay, as long as everybody can hear me okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to keep this uh, fairly short. Um, Q&A session is everybody's favorite part of this type of thing, so I'm pretty good at keeping things short. Um, okay, enough short jokes. Um, so, yeah, in the uh, introduction there, Alphonse talked a little bit about my story, and um, something that I don't really like to do very much is talk about my story, and... Um, but, you know, a lot of the work that we do is relational, and when we're asking other people to, you know, open up about their experiences, it would be kind of hypocritical of me not to do it myself. So, if you'll indulge me for a little bit, this is me kind of stepping out of my comfort zone, um, if I can. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, when I was <clears throat> six years old, I was diagnosed with systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is a uh, condition that affects your joints, um, and it affects about one in every million children. Um, so since then, I've been in pain, um, and, you know, <clears throat> when you live a life in pain, not being able to do certain things that other people do growing up, uh, you end up kind of turning inwards, I think, and uh, trying to learn a little bit about yourself. And, um, you know, so I have been doing that and learning about myself and, um, you know, sort of started to discover that, I don't know if anybody else um, has ever experienced this, but that there was a little voice in my head that um, seemed to really hate me. Um, so it was a struggle to, you know, sort of um, understand that and I got some help from lots of people around me and ended up kind of figuring out that, um, you know, this, this voice in my head is me. Um, it's an aspect of my personality. So um, it was about how you bring those two things together in, and make it into a, a, a real whole. So it wasn't really until, I don't know, my 30s, I guess, that I kind of figured out how to be a whole person. Um, so those are the, that's kind of the lesson that I like to to bring into my work. Uh, thanks, that part's over, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Today I'm here to talk about welcoming communities. Um, so why are communities not as welcoming as they could be? And that's fairly self-evident because we're here at a conference talking about it, so there's obviously some issues. Um, I don't know, but I think I know why I don't know, which is almost as good. And it has to do with systems not working as intended. Or if you're a cynic like me, working exactly as intended. Um, they, don't, they don't work for most of us because of a fundamental flaw in them. But before I get to that, I'll talk a little bit about what exactly a system is. So a system is a set of interconnected parts with a purpose. Um, the parts can't perform the function of the whole on their own. And you can't improve the system by improving the parts by themselves. This can be rigorously proven, but uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, is anybody here an F1 fan? Awesome, yeah, woo! <laughs> so let's say we wanted to design the best possible F1 car. We got all the current F1 cars together and we took them all apart and we got the best engineers to decide what the best parts of each car are. So maybe the, the engine out of the Red Bull car is, is the best engine and the exhaust of the Mercedes is the best exhaust and the drive shaft of another one is, yeah, Mercedes fan in the back. <laughs> um, we put all of those together. Would we end up with the best F1 car? No. 
Uh, in fact, we wouldn't even end up with a car. Uh, it wouldn't work at all. It wouldn't even move. And why? Because the parts don't fit together. And we can understand uh, our community as a system, similarly, uh, that improving the parts of the system to make it more welcoming is not necessarily going to get us to a more welcoming community. We have to understand the community as a part of a larger system. So it in itself is a part of something greater. And community is not a sum of its parts, like all systems, it's a product of its interactions. So the engine of your car doesn't move your car. If you take the engine out and put it on the floor, it doesn't go anywhere. It can't even move itself. The car moves the car. Um, so if you want to improve your community, you need to improve the interactions between members of the community, including all the organizations that we work for. And this explains why, I think, it's so hard for us sometimes to take what we learn at a conference like this, um, where we learning about you know amazing programs that exist elsewhere in the country, um, but it seems difficult for us to take those programs and apply them to our own community sometimes. Or there's a part of us that just kind of knows it's not going to work the same, and that's because you can't interchange parts um, and necessarily improve the system. So that's enough about systems for now. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about land, and uh, this is something that Cornell's taught me a lot, and um, yeah, I'm incredibly blessed to work under the same roof as Cornell and Megan and Don and everybody else you've mentioned. Cornell told me a story one time that when he, um, he took a, when his uh, son was a boy, he took him fishing, and he got to the lake, and there was another group of fishermen down the way a little bit. But they got to the water, and uh, offered some tobacco into the water and said a prayer and um, said thank you to the lake for what it was about to provide them and things like that. And um, they started pulling fish after fish out of the water. And um, before too long, the other group of fishermen came over and were like, what is your secret? How are you doing this? We haven't been able to catch anything all day. And he stopped the story there. And uh, I've later come to learn that um, that's fairly common in indigenous storytelling is uh, you don't really explain the metaphor. But uh, I'm gonna, because I can't help it, I have to explain it. Um, <laughs> this is what I took away from it anyway. I don't know if this is the right explanation or not, but, um, but basically that your intentions matter. Uh, they intended something different when they went to that lake than the other group of fishermen did. And for whatever reason, that made a difference. Um, and the other part that I took away from that is that we don't necessarily need to know why it makes a difference or how, just that it does for whatever reason. And it makes sense that we can't really fully understand this because we're ourselves a biological system called an organism and we're part of a larger whole. And it's hard for parts to see the forest for the trees. So why is land important? Because it births culture. The land, the water, the animals determine the culture. Here in PEI, there's a very distinct culture that probably wouldn't have developed if it was just, if it wasn't an island. Just like the island nation, whose culture developed an empire upon which the sun didn't set, as they like to say, Great Britain. Which gets back to our fundamental flaw. Our systems were conceived by British minds to achieve British purposes. And here's the flaw. This land isn't Britain. This land has its own spirit, its own cultures that it birthed. And to attempt to impose upon it an alien system is to fundamentally misunderstand our relationship with land. Culture is not a part that can be transplanted. It's a unique symbiosis between people and place. And if you look at our, uh, the speaker yesterday about Little Mosque on the Prairie, it's a perfect example. It's not Little Mosque, it's Little Mosque on the Prairie. So this is the fundamental flaw in the systems that we call a community and explains why we struggle with welcoming people. The ironic twist, and to me this is just life having fun, <laughs> it's not fun, but it's just sometimes ironic, is that the answer to how to build a welcoming community on this land likely exists in the understandings and cultural, cultural practices that colonizers sought to destroy. 
And this is why we struggle. Until reconciliation really happens, how can we ever say we're building a welcoming community? That's why I'm asking IRCC, please figure out a way for immigration to benefit First Nations as much as it benefits my community. Because until that happens, there is little to no incentive for Indigenous communities to help solve the problems that colonizers created. But boy, could we really use the help. So to sum, if you want to understand your job, look at it as part of a larger system, and how that system is just a part of a larger system, and so on, and so on, until you understand the whole universe. Um, scientists used to try to understand the universe by taking it apart. Um, lots of different disciplines did this. In biology, there's the cell, and in chemistry, there's a nice little organized table of all the most basic elements. Um, but in physics, it was the atom, and then, I don't know, there's a bunch of other things now. Um, but it turns out that was the opposite approach that, that people should have been taking. Uh, you can't understand the universe by taking it apart. So you, can't, you have to understand, in order to understand an atom, you have to first understand the universe. Secondly, if you want to build better systems, try starting with reconciliation. And we almost had the best example ever. I was working on my dawn impression last night, but I, I don't know if I want to do it. Best example ever, uh, no, not quite, um, to share that, that this actually does work, that if you try reconciliation first and use it to build better systems, uh, it will, it, things will fall into place. Um, and we had the, mm, the perfect example of how this all works, but we're not allowed to talk about it yet. So um, if anybody maybe wants to ply me with some lobster rolls later, it might loosen my lips, but uh, until then, you know, just keep your eyes and ears open. Um, so, yeah, that's all I gotta really say. Thank you. Wolfie da. C'est vraiment extraordinaire cette façon de, à la fois, de raconter sa vie et de tirer les leçons pour les autres. Nous avons vu ça avec Cornel quand il nous a parlé, par exemple, d'être dans la vision de cette, de cette personne, de, de, de ce magicien du village qu'il a vu comme, euh, comme le porte-flambeau de la diversité, quelqu'un qui marche avec un groupe, c'est extrêmement important. Et il a tiré les leçons euh, pour nous-mêmes dans la situation actuelle dans laquelle nous sommes dans notre pays. Et nous avons aussi vu Mitch partie de sa propre histoire pour nous expliquer comment euh, le, la, la, la question, la notion même de communauté immigrante, c'est un système qui a des parties. Et ce système-là, réellement, ne peut pas suivre si ces parties-là ne fonctionnent pas. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup pour, euh, pour ça. Et nous allons rapidement continuer avec euh, une autre partie tout aussi importante de notre... Euh, de, de nos panélistes. Il s'agit cette fois de Daniel Ohebu, qui est Executive Director of the Atlantic Student Development Alliance. Daniel est le directeur exécutif de l'Alliance pour le développement des étudiants de l'Atlantique, ASDA, fort d'une vaste expérience en recherche qualitative, en analyse phénoménologique interprétative et en analyse du discours. Il conçoit et anime des ateliers qui adoptent une approche personnelle, interpersonnelle et systémique afin de bâtir des cultures organisationnelles inclusives. En 2020, le magazine Atlantic Business l'a sélectionné et l'a nommé Bridge Builders en tant qu'un des 30 innovateurs de moins de 30 ans au Canada atlantique. Il a reçu plusieurs prix, notamment le prix individu exceptionnel de l'Association des Nouveaux Arrivants de l'île du Prince-Édouard pour son travail continu et son implication dans le soutien des communautés grandissantes de nouveaux arrivants de l'île du Prince-Édouard. Il a aussi reçu le prix de l'organisateur communautaire décerné, décerné par Faces of Fusions de Charlottetown pour ses importantes contributions à la communauté de Charlottetown par le biais de l'activisme du bénévolat et de l'engagement communautaire. Et enfin, 
Il a reçu le prix Resource Abilities Appreciation Award pour avoir été un leader dans le mouvement EDI et pour avoir organisé un événement de sensibilisation et de collecte de fonds pour soutenir le travail de Resource Abilities. Eh bien, euh, c'est un, un honneur pour moi de d'introduire ici une fois de plus euh, Daniel qui va, faire la, qui va passer ici devant pour ces sept minutes. Daniel, à toi la parole. Merci. How are we doing? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to uh, thank Mitch for sparking the light and Elder Cornell as well. Thank you so much for your words. Um, really, what I, I, I thought this would be a panel, so I don't really have a presentation, but I, I think I just want to build on, on top of what Mitch told us today. And I want to start by sharing a, a TikTok uh, video uh, that I shared with the group yesterday at the Summerside uh, room when we were having our session. Uh, and I want to start by saying that the system is not broken. We're not trying to fix a system. You're not trying to save anyone because the system is functioning as it should. And let's apply the, uh, the rules or let's apply the principles of critical race theory and I'll share an example. So imagine a guy who hates disabled people build a hotel uh, to, and to ban uh, all disabled people, and this person builds it in such a way to specifically make access difficult for all disabled people. Years later, he sells the hotel to a new owner who has no problem with disabled people. So you have a hotel where the owner has no problem with the disabled, and neither do any of the staff. However, due to the actions of the previous owner, the hotel is still built in a way that, is, that doesn't accommodate disabled people. So here we're talking about no disabled parking, no ramps, no extra accommodations, and the list goes on. So although the people currently running it are not actively discriminating, although they are not actively discriminating against disabled people, they are operating a system designed to discriminate and need to fix it even if they aren't to blame for it. Critical race theory is primarily acknowledging and identifying the historic and systemic problems that make the hotel inaccessible, and secondarily, identifying ways to fix those problems. So yes, you might not have started this mess that we currently live in, but you're responsible for it. You're responsible for making the world a better place than you found it. And if we look at, uh, kind of, I'm a roots and structures person, and the problem we're trying to solve, um, or I would say the approach or the vision for a better Canada or for a better community uh, that we're trying to see here, we have to look at it from our roots and structures as a country or as a nation. Canada is and Canada was built on racism. Stolen land, stolen resources, stolen people. And it's still being built on racism. So one thing about settler colonialism is that I'm from Nigeria, West Africa. When the, col when the colonial masters came, they left. So we gained our independence. In Canada, they came, they settled. And one thing about settler colonialism is that it is ingrained in our policies, it is ingrained in our practices, it is ingrained in our processes, it is ingrained in our systems, and it's ingrained in our structures. However, we can't always point the fingers on the systems and the structures because behind those systems and structures are real individuals like yourselves and mine, and myself as well, that continue to either perpetrate, benefit those systems, or can challenge and work against those systems. When we look at the roots and uh, when we look at the roots of oppression in Canada, we look at colonialism, whiteness and white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy. There's one more. Sorry. Yeah, but there's one more. Um, this is just a crash course that I'm giving you, uh, folks, for free. But pretty much, 
Um, pretty much um, what I'm trying to say by that is that when you're looking at building welcoming communities, you have to put the roots of oppression in Canada in place. You have to build with those roots in mind. So again, we're not working, uh, we're not trying to solve a problem because the system, like Mitch said, is working as it should. It is functioning as it should. So what I want to leave, I want to share a story, uh, uh, an individual I was working with, um, where when we laid her evidence down, we, we realized that she was uh, wrongfully fired be, um, because of discrimination. And we can cite racism, we can cite Islamophobia as well too. And this individual said something to me that still st stuck to me or that still sticks to me till today. And they said for, for, for them, it is, it is just a job. They wake up at 9 a.m. in the morning and they leave at 5 p.m. at night. But for me, it's my life. The communities that we want to serve, the communities and the people that we want to serve, they don't have the privilege to check out between nine, before nine or after five. They live with race and racism every day. They experience race and racism ex every day. They experience the color of their skin. They experience their religion. They experience their culture. They experience that every day. So they don't have the privilege to, to check out or they don't have the privilege to check out before nine or after five. So I think what I'm here to do is to challenge you and to inspire you, hopefully, that this work is not just a job, it is a duty. It is a responsibility that you owe to the communities that you serve. It is a responsibility that, that you owe to the people that you serve to serve them. It is not about you, it was never about you. It did not start with you and it's not gonna end with you, but the work flows through you. So be a catalyst. Be a catalyst. Listen to the communities. They have the information, they have the knowledge. Listen to the communities that you serve. Get information from them and work for them, fight for them, and serve them. Something else that I want to um, also uh, challenge is the discourse of homogeneity that, ex that exists within our work as well. That whenever we work, we always lump and homogenize groups. Um, the phrase that we use currently is BIPOC meaning black, indigenous, and people of color. That is a harmful way of doing our work um, because within that discourse, you are eliminating the different identities and individuals that exist within the discourse of black, indigenous, and people of color. So stop lumping and homogenizing these groups. I am black, and I was telling my friend uh, over there that uh, yesterday, when I came to Canada was when I realized I was black. I never really knew I was black until I came here. Um, and, and, my, and, and, and when I look at my work and, and the, the work that we have to do as, as organizations that work with the system, it is our responsibility and our duty to learn about ourselves, number one, and to learn about our history. Again, I work with most employers, and when, what they tell me oftentimes is that, oh, I have diversity in my organization, and when I look at their website, I just see white men and white women. You have to be very specific. When you talk about women, who are you talking about? Are you talking about white women? Are you talking about black women? Are you talking about indigenous women? Are you talking about brown women? When you talk about the 2S two, two uh, two plus, two S LGBTQIA plus community, who are you referring to? There are multiple identities within these communities. There are multiple identities within this identity. You have to approach it from an intersectional lens. You have to be very specific with who you're dealing with and who you're trying to solve a problem for. So I guess all that to say um, that as individuals and as, as a community and as organizations, it is your duty. It is your duty to serve these communities they don't have the privilege to, to, to check out before 9 a.m. and after 5 p.m. I know you're dealing with funders. Something I also want to emphasize that our elder shared earlier today, this morning, is emphasis on collaboration. We're all here together. We need to collaborate. The ecosystem is so, stri it's so deprived of resources and capacity that we don't have the access or the privilege to work in silos. We can't compete with each other. Again, that is, again, the, the, the nature of the systems that we work with and the systems that we are trying to address. But we have to work together. And that's the only way we can move forward. And again, I would love to sow a seed in your heart to say, 
that every day you wake up in the morning, I want you to think about how you can leave the world in a better place than you found it. Every day, ask yourself that question. Have I left the world in a better place than I found it? If you wake up in the morning, ask yourself the same question. How can I leave the world in a better place than I found it? Like I said, it is not just a job. It is a duty. You owe those communities out there the duty and the responsibility to serve them. So please get out of their way and get out of your own way and serve them. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Daniel. Et nous allons passer la parole tout de suite à Cathy. Cathy Woodbeck est directrice générale de l'association multiculturelle de Tonde B, qu'elle dirige depuis 29 ans. Elle a été membre du Conseil national de l'établissement pour les petits centres. Diplômée de l'université Lakehead en 1993, elle a été conseillère municipale de la petite communauté de Conmi, forte de sa vaste expérience dans le secteur de l'établissement des immigrants et, de, et des langues. Elle a représenté le nord au sein des divers groupes de travail et comités et conseils provinciaux et nationaux et a été un membre actif d'initiatives communautaires d'accueil. Cathy offre du mentorat et de la formation aux agences et aux municipalités sur le développement communautaire et la création de communautés accueillantes. Elle se concentre sur le service aux petites, aux petites communautés, aux communautés accueillantes et éloignées et aux communautés nordiques sur l'établissement des nouveaux arrivants, sur l'acquisition de la langue et sur les stratégies des petits centres pour créer des communautés accueillantes. Donc, je vais passer la parole à Cathy pour ces sept minutes. Cathy, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much. I'm handed the last baton in the race when you're in a, a relay and it's uh, run the fastest because we're almost at the end. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association and I really want to um, talk about putting some of the things that were already mentioned into place and how do we do that? How do we do that on the ground uh, in a frontline situation with newcomers to Canada? So we serve an area that is probably larger than Prince Edward Island. We have a central location in Thunder Bay and then 32 um, small municipalities, four a bit larger municipalities in that region. So when we talk smaller centers, we have a lot of them. And when we're working with municipal leaders, with um, agencies in all of those communities, they can be anything from 400 people to about 20,000 people. And the city of Thunder Bay itself had about 120,000. We are located on um, the, the lands of the Ojibwe uh, First Nations, uh, directly adjacent to Thunder Bay is the Fort William First Nation. So a lot of the work that we do really fits in with what Cornell was talking about in uh, working closely together and the experiences that newcomer youth and in indigenous youth have in moving to Thunder Bay are very, very similar. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things we've been doing. That is Nanabiju, the sleeping giant that lies out in the harbor in Lake Superior. And uh, it's just a reminder each day of the heritage of Thunder Bay and the land that we're on. So really our community um, engagement process started um, by building relationships. We, I wanna talk a little bit more about that on the ground work that we've done with newcomers, with indigenous youth, with people moving into our city and our region from all over the world, but also from within Canada. And we, we wanted to connect with mayors, local councils, with chambers of commerce, with employers, with everyone in the community that wants you to come and present something to them rather than becoming part of the change that needs to happen in communities. 
come and teach us this. Come and give us this session so that we can check a box and say we've done the whatever. And that's really from police services all the way to the chamber to municipal councils. The Northern Ontario Municipal Association meets um, twice a year and they meet in Thunder Bay and they want us to come and present what's been happening. What's been happening with newcomers? Who's arriving in the communities? What's happening with employment? How can we help grow our communities? But it's never from, it was never from a perspective of um, how, can, uh, how can our community do this? It's what will you do for us? So we started to change that discussion and talk a little more about what can the communities do? What do they need to help them to grow? What do they need to get involved in? How do they need to find champions? Who's going to be the person within your community that does some of this work? Rather than an agency always coming to do that and teach that and help you with it. So we built our, um, our local connections by creating some buy-in in the communities and talking to the people that we knew first. In a small community, you all know this if you're working in small communities, everyone knows everyone. You know who you're gonna call when it's the, you're looking for whatever it happens to be. If you are talking environmental issues, you know who you're going to call. If you need someone to hire uh, somebody, if you have a newcomer that arrives that is a carpenter, you know who you're gonna call because they own a business. So let's start engaging some of these folks and getting them involved in doing the work, being a champion, helping us introduce um, not just anti-racism, anti-oppression issues into the community, but introduce newcomers to the community, introduce them to our groups of friends. Connector programs are great when you have a volunteer and you do that officially, but let's do that unofficially. And really our, our main goal and the main goal of all of our, our programs and our local immigration partnership and the rural and northern immigration pro uh, program is to improve the outcomes for newcomers and to create that welcoming community. So the first step in our process was never to assume that everyone that's coming to the table of our RNIP program, of our LIP, of anything else, is all at the same level of understanding or even gets it when it comes to anti-racism and anti-oppression. We, you don't assume that everyone is on the same page as you. We always assume that we're working with the lowest common denominator and we don't want to start from that perspective where you get down the road of an immigration program and then you have someone make a comment that really scares you and makes you realize that they were not on board from the beginning. So we think that that little bit of work at the beginning is really very, very important when you start moving forward. When we were talking about diversity and policing in our community, um, one of the chiefs told me, you know, I think there's a few bad apples in the barrel. And our conversation then was, I said, I, I think it might be the barrel. And he looked at me and we went, hmm. And we started that talk around how do you change the broader picture, the big systems, the, the, the structure, rather than saying it's a few individuals because it's not and everyone talked about that, right, already. We started small. We wanted to host small sessions, lunch and learns. Um, we have an elder on our board of directors who likes to host lunch and learn sessions, and she owns a restaurant in um, the mall in Thunder Bay, and she's called the Bannock Lady, an Ojibwe First Nation woman who owns her restaurant, and we host small sessions there. And she has her um, statement and information on her wall in Ojibwe, and she does a presentation, and she can do safe food handling courses there, you name it. But it's a perspective for newcomers that's genuine and it's, it's organic, and they can come and learn from an elder and not just be classroom taught in a different situation. So we like to take a different approach, a really grassroots approach of connecting people to the community. Years ago, 2007, we were talking about these things, and here we've been working on them for a very long time. And I just wanted to put that first quote in there around what a welcoming community is, and this is from a small center strategy from, a long, from 2007, and, and the toolbox of ideas for small centers. It's, it's the same, it really, you know, we've been talking about this for ages. If all of the individuals in a community feel valued and are, participating, it will thrive. So success breeds success. And it needs to happen on all levels. 
and the us and them conversation within youth. Um, our youth groups, our Indigenous youth group and our newcomer youth group are one. And what they talk about there um, quite often is how and when do the us become, or the them become us? There is us and there is them, and when do these things blend? At what point do you feel like you're part of us and not them? And uh, it's very interesting. We sit back and listen to the youth talk about their experiences. And Cornell said that the, the Indigenous youth experience is very similar to uh, newcomer youth experience, especially coming into Thunder Bay. It really is. But for them to talk with each other about what they've gone through, and in a couple of situations, one or the other have said, oh, but you don't understand what I've gone through. And as they spend more time with each other, they realize you do understand what I've gone through. You understand what my experience is. This is a project that we did. Our um, youth, uh, Indigenous youth, newcomer youth, um, Canadian-born youth, the Can um, everyone together worked on a graffiti wall, but it was around um, reconciliation and identity and land, and this is just the opening of the, the e exhibit and all of the artists talking about what their um, pieces were about. And it's a beautiful space leading up to our building on uh, Court Street in Thunder Bay. Our learning days really focus around having that type of a conversation, never presentation. It's not a classroom style. It's not a, a university course. It's a community being involved and, and engaging everyone that you can at every level. So from um, newcomer youth in schools, being involved with municipal leaders, sending people into um, leadership types of mentorship positions so that um, young people can be a part of the Rotary Club, go with someone to a meeting, spend time with them. Actually going to municipal council meetings, not for the in-camera type of session that you can't be a part of, but for everything else, to really start understanding what your community is about, but for those leaders more so to understand what uh, youth, what newcomers are all about and what they've gone through and what they are um, looking for in our community. How can we make them feel more welcome? We've also had great success with employers. Employers now, after our rural and northern immigration pilot, employers are really on board with making their employees feel welcome. I think they've learned a lot about their workplace. They've learned a lot about what their other employees are like as far as welcoming goes. And so now there's, um, there's a piece before uh, anyone is hired or even before they're placed that the employer starts to think about what, uh, what they need to do in the workplace and others are letting them know that. So we have employer forums where employers who have hired from our rural and northern immigration pilot are talking about what's happened in their workplace, what happened with the rest of their workforce, what they've encountered along the way, and now um, how do they assist others in helping that not happen and making it a smoother transition and making it more welcoming. That employer engagement piece has been really very, very important in reducing um, the, the racism in, in the workplace and really helping uh, them to feel like they're part of that family of a workforce. It's uh, when there's a need on one side of employment and an employer is looking for a certain thing, hasn't been able to fill positions, there's also that urgency and you have the ability to say, you have to make this work because you don't have another choice after this. This is one of the uh, workshops that our youth got involved in. So really integrating um, what we're doing on all levels. So it was an outdoor uh, collection, Poplar uh, Bud and Poplar Sav workshop. And it was a discussion on climate and climate change, but through a really different perspective. So we tried to make things a bit different, look at it in a different way. And, and do things a little bit differently so that everyone is participating, they're learning what we want, but they're doing it through a hands-on and with um, both the Indigenous community and the newcomer community together. Our learning days have really improved uh, community awareness. Getting out there in the media, having your media on board is a good thing in, in some cases, and it's also um, important to show 
what's happening on the grassroots level, but it's not always a big production. It's not always putting out the media and the promotional information. It's that day-to-day -day on the ground, making a difference, connecting people, having them work together and get to know each other that really starts to spread through a community. And we saw it with the um, arrival of the Ukrainians where the community got together, but it was credit unions and cooperatives and grocery cooperatives and others that really got together to make that um, work and to welcome people. And so those are the ways that in small communities you see that happen. Small communities that are 400 people or more, if you have two or three families move into the city, that's a noticeable thing if they're moving into a community. So everyone has to be on board to try and help and make that welcoming happen. So some of the, um, the handout, the work that we've done really is around helping small, small communities welcome people, keep them, and try to integrate them into all of uh, the programs and all of the small neighborhood family type of things, the, the really small um, activities that are happening. Not just a program that's officially provided by a municipality, but what's happening with families and connecting with schools and friends and all the other pieces of that. Um, this focus on providing programs is one piece, but providing connections and supporting all of the community things that happen is another, and getting everyone involved in doing that is really critical. This is the culmination of the art project. It was beaded. It was a, a work that was about four by eight that the um, Arts Collective and called now the Solidarity Collective. They started out as a group of uh, youth from newcomer communities, very, very recent arrivals. In fact, including some of the Afghans that just arrived in December and um, Indigenous students that are coming into high school in Thunder Bay and others who are part of our multicultural club in the high school all got together and did an art project and this is beaded. The original is all beads and it was led by um, an in indigenous elder, a woman in Thunder Bay who created a pattern. Everyone worked on it for about six weeks straight and uh, then the photo was taken of it, and it's now a billboard. And uh, this billboard in Thunder Bay, they plan to leave up as long as we don't have to pay for it. It's going to be there, um, I think, probably as long as the company can uh, feasibly do that, because they think it's incredible, and the story behind it is incredible. So we took every opportunity to make the media behind that um, as much exposure as we could get, uh, the youth tell the stories, but it's the grassroots piece. And I think that's also a very important piece of what, what we do in connecting people to our community and to really combat um, racism and create welcoming communities is that type of um, small group session that really connects people. Not always, not always the big thing, it's what we do in the background as well. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que nous n'aurons pas droit aux questions. Nous avons pris le temps de la pause, donc nous allons vraiment, je vous veux demander d'applaudir de nouveau pour tout ce panel et merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Bye bye. So yes, Alphonse already shared that we are running a little bit out of time, but behind in our schedule. But I must say that there was so much inspiration to take from that panel. There was I couldn't keep up, right? I was writing so fast. But I also just think that the way in which you told the stories, and that's been a theme that we've been talking about for the last couple of days, is the stories matter in small centers. That is how we have the impact. So I really just want to thank you for bringing the magic sauce to this day, for adding so much spirit and light to the workshop, and for sharing your stories. Each and every one of you really brought so much to today, and one of the best panels I've ever heard. So thank you again to everybody. So before we break for our 15 minutes before our next workshop, we would like to take a minute to especially thank the incredible leaders who came together to make the conference possible. Um, so take a moment to thank the National Small Center Advisory Committee.
And the other thank you that I wanted to take a minute was like, how cool was that graphic facilitation? I don't know about you, but I was sitting there being like, oh my God, it's in real time. So I would like to take a minute to thank Ashen Rodenheiser from Minds Eye Creative for what was an incredible storyboarding of that really beautiful workshop.